Perfect. Cool. So welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Brad Monaghan and this is Dr. Thomas Watt. Thomas Watt. And we are today in sunny Brisbane in um, Australia. So we've got a fair few people logged in from all over the world. Uh, but we'll just let you know where we are. So this is the first part of a three-part series of webinars. Today we are going to cover PD instruments, specifically the UltraTev Plus 2. And we are going to cover what is in the box. So as in, if you purchase an UltraTev Plus 2, what is actually in the box? and what does every part of the test equipment do, how to use it correctly, and some associated instruments that, that uh, can be purchased later that actually plug into the Ultratev Plus 2 to help you out with your testing. So what we've got here is, we are, I'll just get my laser out. Today we're gonna to cover our most, apply our most appropriate monitoring techniques and collecting that condition data. In our, in our previous webinars, we've covered understanding failure modes amongst a lot of other things. Next time we'll go through data analysis. So we'll, we'll run a webinar specifically on how to analyze the data, how to analyze the phase plots and the waveforms. And after that, we'll run a third webinar, which is around planning some, action, planning some actions and population management. So that's all about what to do next. Once you've found it, once you've done, done as many tests as you can. Having some technical issues. I can't hear it. No, I think they just can't see the webcam. Oh, there we go. Can you see us? Hopefully, everyone can see us. Yep. No worries. Okay. So, we will go on from there. Hopefully everyone could hear us because we did a fair bit of talking to yeah. Okay, so the next slide. So a little bit about who is EA Technology. So back in the 60s, uh, EA Technology was the Electricity Council Research Centre for the UK. So there's six different power companies in the UK and we used to be the research division for those section, uh, for those companies. And we were funded by all the power companies. We uh, did a whole hub heap of research and development into making the power companies run more economically, preventing failures, assisting with standard lighting and, and all those types of things. Through to the 90s, we, kept, we became privatised and came out as a proper private company. And from there, the company was taken worldwide where we are currently in one of our offices. So the head office is over here in the UK in a town called Chester which is right near Manchester, if anyone knows where that is. Over in America, we've got an office in New Jersey. We've got an office in Shanghai, in China, an office in Singapore. And this is where Thomas and I are sitting right now in Brisbane, Australia. And on the left and right hand side of the, the world map, there are a whole heap of companies that we have done work for in the past and are currently doing work for now. So what EA technology can provide? Thomas and I work mainly in the high voltage monitoring section of the company, and we'll talk a lot about that now. Um, we also have low voltage interventions where we can provide low voltage monitoring of circuits. We can assist with low voltage uh, cable fault location, low voltage, um, low voltage reclosers, and that type of thing. We have a large section of consultancy within our business that can help with a range of high voltage and low voltage and future networks type uh, planning consultancy services. And we have a software uh, arm of the company that assists with all three. And moving into the HV monitoring part of the section, we have handout instrumentation and that's what we'll be focusing on today. This is portable PD monitoring test equipment that you can hold in your hand, walk into a substation and test for partial discharge. We also have permanent 24 seven PD monitoring systems and hardware that you can permanently install onto switchboards, switch gear or high voltage cables to 24 seven log PD activity from the assets under test. We have over in the, it's not in Australia, but over in the UK, we have an oil lab where 
We can do oil diagnostics testing um, and overhead line inspection analysis and substation surveying se sections over there. And we also have a forensics lab where we can conduct failure investigations to you know, figure out exactly why something failed or why a, or what condition things are in at the moment. So as an example, we have a few companies in Australia that ship over failed cable joints or cable sections that they've cut out, cut out from the ground and they want to figure out why something failed or what condition it's in right now. That's over in the UK. And this is what we'll be going through today. We'll be covering path from discharge, then I'll hand over to Thomas, who will go through the Ultratet Plus 2 and what is actually in the box when you purchase an Ultratet Plus 2. He'll go through ultrasonics, as was uh, we got 19% on the poll. He'll go through TEV, which we got 38%, so spend a bit more time on the TEV. We'll go through cable PD testing by your high frequency current transformer. And then he'll hand back over to me and we'll go through the Ultratev Locator 2, which does TEV locating by time of flight and UHF testing, and then we'll have some summary and questions. Now, we have a questions box, so if anyone would like some specific questions answered, you can type into that questions box. I think you just need to open it up on your, on your viewing pane there. And there's also a chat box. So if you open up both of them, you can see um, a chat and a questions box. So please use them whenever you want. We'll answer the questions as we go, and then any of the um, bigger ones we'll kind of bring up at the end that yep. we'd like to go through specifically. Or we can always get back to you. If you, if you request some further information, we can get, get back to you offline after the webinar. Okay, so partial discharge. What is partial discharge? Uh, there's many, there's a few webinars we've ran and we talk a lot about what partial discharge is and why it occurs. So we'll just do a quick overview here. Basically, PD is going to be happening within or on high voltage insulation. PD, I always picture it as tiny little sparks that are occurring over and over and over, as too much electrical stress is being induced or imposed upon a defect that is either in the insulation or on the insulation. And sparks occur over time, and those sparks can degrade that insulation to the point where some tracking occurs and there's not enough insulation left. And then you get a high voltage explosion and the asset will fail in service. And that's what we're trying to prevent here. So the first one is internal void insulation, and that's where you've got cracks or splits or voids or air bubbles or gaps or inclusions, some sort of uh, defect that's on the inside of high voltage insulation. Then what we have is called surface discharge, and that's where you've got some sort of defect on the outside of the insulation. And it can be a defect where there's a sharp point or a gap or a split or something like that, or an air void on the outside of the insulation that's touching the insulation. Then you can have things that are just too close to the insulation. A typical example of that would be your high voltage cable terminations. If you have a CT or some secondary wiring or an earth cable or another phase of that cable termination, if they're too close to each other, they can cause discharge across the air gap that is between those two assets. We also have corona. So the definition of corona is from a, a physical sharp point into a gas. A gas is usually air. Uh, the easiest way to find corona is to go out to an outdoor switchyard and you hear a lot of buzzing and arcing going on. And usually it's coming from the end of a piece of metal where there's something pointy or something sharp at right angles. And the basically all the electric field lines get concentrated at the end of that sharp point and it breaks down the air that's very close to it and sparks jump out from that sharp point into that gas. And then we have what's called contact or floating metalwork or gap type discharge. So the worst type of this is where you have a poor high voltage connection and you have sparks jumping across that gap and that will effectively be a hot connection that can fail over time. You can also have uh, floating metalwork and gap type discharges where you have two pieces of metal that aren't necessarily bonded or earthed properly and because the two pieces of metal are very close to each other, they're close to the HV, you've got an induced voltage into those pieces of metal and the two, the two pieces of metal are running at a different voltage. So sparks will jump across that gap because of the potential difference. Okay, so we've covered that in many other webinars, but we're not covering that here. That's just an overview. So now I'll hand over to Thomas and swap spots with Thomas. <laughs> 
Thank you, Brad. So as Brad said, we've covered a lot of the PD theory in, behalf, uh, in the past, and we're gonna cover a lot of the analysis in the future. However, something that we get asked a lot is what tools do we use? Both Brad and I are in the field on a very regular basis doing PD testing. So people ask us, what exactly are we using? When do we use different equipment? And what is the best method to go about the testing? So today we're gonna to go through basically what we do, what the different uh, instruments and accessories do do, and when to best apply each one. So the main thing is what comes in the box. And we do have two separate types of boxes for the UltraTev Plus 2. We've got the Kit 3 in Brad's hands and the Kit 2 that I was holding up. The main difference between these two kits is the inclusion of the ultrasonic dish. All the other aspects are the same. So if you don't have overhead assets, if you purely have ground-based assets, then you only need the kit too. Whereas if you are going to be testing overhead, be it on lines or in outdoor yards, we recommend you get the kit three with the additional dish. But the main feature of the kits is the UltraTev Plus 2 device. So this is the UltraTev Plus 2 device here. It's a handheld device. And this is where all of the thinking happens. It's where all of the data is recorded. It's where all of the algorithms tell you or give you an indication of what is happening. It also includes the main TEV array at the front, which is the um, sensor, as well as an inbuilt ultrasonic microphone. The other accessories we talk about today will purely plug into this device. All of the thinking, processing is done in this one centralized spot and then we just plug in accessories to support what we're doing based on the type of test we do and those accessories come into two main categories we've got our ultrasonic accessories which is things like the flexible sensors the contact probes which Brad is holding up now and then the ultrasonic dish and those are our ultrasonic accessories we've then got things for um, measuring cable PD such as the HFCT or if you have one of the older kits, it would be an RFCT, so the black version. And those are our main data capturing accessories that come in the kit and the things that you'll use in order to find and locate PD. You've then got all your peripheral devices like the temperature and humidity sensor, which you just use to keep track of what is happening on site, as well as the things like the NFC tags, which every box comes with an example of six and they can be used to store data locally for trending. And that just allows you to get a quick trend of what is happening on one particular asset on site. From there, it comes with all the obvious things like your charging cables that has a car charger, if you are traveling long distances, and an SD card adapter so you can plug it into your computer with a bit more ease. But that in overall is the kit. So this particular kit is what me and Brad use on our day-to-day -day basis. This would cover 90% easily of our PD testing, and we use the other additional accessories or other products when we're looking for a more specific problem. Um, go through that once we get to the other accessories. So the UltraTef Plus 2 is, as I said, it's the main brains of the equipment. It's where all of your inbuilt PD classification and interpretation will be displayed and recorded. Everything you can do on this device, everything you are going to see today, all the screenshots, all the pods, are all recorded using the device's own functionality. Anything this device can do, it can record and allow you to analyze later, be it still on site to get a bigger screen or back in the office. One of the most powerful things about these recordings is that you can actually pre-set up all of your substations in the form of workflows beforehand. People's substations tend not to change very quickly. So you can actually design them all and load them into the plus two, which makes your surveying process a lot quicker and a lot more fluid. It means you don't have to enter all the data every time. You have a preset substation layout, which you're just attaching data to. Then once you're out in the field, the device will automatically sync via your, um, your lights in the room or by the EMF in the air and it will sync to the frequency of your network. And this is used to get more accuracy with the data and build those phase results patterns, which is that's just so crucial to the analysis process. And we'll go through that more in the analysis webinar. Once we are there, you can do a lot of very fun things for data capturing. 
the device has full Wi-Fi and hotspot functionality. So you can actually log into it and attach photos and data to the survey files so you can analyze them back in the office. We use that specifically just so all of our data is in one place and we don't have to jump between photos, between the PD data. Everything is just tied up in a nice package. And then the final points there are, it does have lithium ion batteries. They are very reliable. Both Brad and I can do full days of testing without really having to worry about the battery at all. You'll easily get a full eight hours of testing out of it with no issue. And then finally, it does all run off expandable memory. So the memory card in this is an SD slot. You can see it at the base here. And that's what you're looking at for um, storing all of the data. So from here, we'll go into ultrasonic testing. So your ultrasonic testing is looking at picking up your surface tracking and corona type PD sources. What you're doing with that is you're listening. So in a lot of our trainings, we always say that with the ultrasonic type testing, you are going to be listening to the problem. You're using the microphone to try and identify that sound of the arcing and the sparking put off by PD. So to do this, the main one that we use, and the main one that most people will be using is the flexible sensor. And that's this one here, or Brad has it right now. And the flexible sensor uses the exact same inbuilt microphone as what's in the device. It is just a far easier um, accessory to use rather than moving the device all around the switch gear. It allows you to both look at the screen, look at the algorithms, as well as still move about while listening to the sound. Now the flexible sensor is a microphone. It entirely relies on an air path from the PD source, be it surface tracking or corona, for an air path for that sound to travel through and reach the sensor. And that's what you'll use on all of your air insulated switch gears, um, all your cable boxes, your bus chambers, things where there's no interruption between the PD source and yourself. And to do that, you're going all around the edges of the um, switch gear. So you're looking around the folds in the metal work through your breather vents, through open bolt holes that you have. So you're just looking for all those air paths to come out to get a reliable reading. Unfortunately, that isn't always possible. And particularly with newer style gear, they're very well sealed and they have a lot less air paths. They're very well gasketed. So what we use in those types of scenarios is the contact probe. And if we refer to the flexible sensor as a microphone, the contact probe would be your doctor's stethoscope. So rather than looking in an air path, you actually magnetically attach it to the front of metalwork, and then it picks up the vibrations of the sound waves hitting that metalwork. So you can see into chambers that you would not be able to see into without the flex with the flexible sensor. And it just allows a lot more, or a lot more different types of analysis for different switch gears. You do just have to be quite careful with the contact probe. It can be a bit more susceptible to vibration. And when things do get that 50 kilohertz hum going, you just have to make sure you're picking up PD and not the vibration of your switch gear. The final ultrasonic sensor that we use is the ultrasonic dish. And this is the one that's only available in the kit three. So with the dish, we use it for your long range sensors. And that's things like doing your overhead line doing your underground overhead terminations or your outdoor yards. So the dish is made to be quite effective for up to about 20 metres away. That can be further once you find a, a higher level source, but 20 metres is just a good medium to think about. To do this, you're pointing it up and down the exact same as all of your other sensors going over all your different assets, but you're using the inbuilt laser, which it has in to show where you're pointing, or it does have an inbuilt gun sight so you have a good idea of what testing it. One thing that we've started to use the dish for a lot more in recent times is actually testing the switch gear that has exclusion zones point around it. Brad and I both deal with a number of clients who have certain RMUs that once they open the doors they don't like people standing too close to them due to previous failures. So for assets like that we can open the doors, stand well back and still do a full ultrasonic sweep and have it quite pinpointed to test them. And it's, it's worked very well for maintaining that safety aspect as well in sites that we would traditionally use the flexible sensor for 
but the dish has brought a really good safety aspect into it. So these are just some examples of us using it in the field, and we actually have some videos we can play for you of what we are looking at. So I'll share a video with you now of our Brad here doing a flexible sensor sweep. So we just take a little bit to buffer. So I apologize, we just got told you couldn't hear us. So <laughs> that was just a video of Brad going around switch gear with the testing. So in that one, he was going a little bit fast. I think the buffering aired out a little bit there, but you're going around the edges of all of the switch gear, you're looking for any open bolt holes, any metal overlap where air could be coming out. And you can see that as well in just this um, example here with me testing. So we'd be going around all of these gaps here, down and around, through any vent, um, vents, through any sort of operating handles, any hole into the switch gear, and that's where you'd be testing. You've then got your ultrasonic contact probe where you're not far off doing the opposite. So you're putting the contact probe in the middle of the panel and you're listening for the vibrations caused by those sound waves. In this particular example, you can actually see that Brad's chosen to put the contact probe on top of the sticker. And what that has done is it's to get the best possible contact between our sensor and the board. That board in particular had that stippled paint, so it wasn't perfectly smooth. So when you put the sensor on it, you're not getting 100% of your sensor touching the metalwork. So in that scenario, we start to put them on the stickers in order to get the best coupling and you'll get the best result. You can also use coupling gels and waters in order to get the best result. However, most of the time we find just putting it on the, um, the thin stickers on the switch gear is very effective for getting the optimal reading. Us here in the field, just testing your underground overhead terminations. So you can easily stand at the base of the pole and cover that entire asset. Traditionally, we would normally walk around the pole as we do this and triangulate it, just to make sure you're, what you are pointing the dish at is exactly what you are picking signals up on. You just have to make sure that you're not detecting something behind the asset you are testing. So a bit of movement in the field, especially testing overhead assets, is very, very critical for these types of testing. Uh, I just don't think it's gonna work. You can't hear us. So as I said, these all have an inbuilt interpretation with them. So what we've got here is two screens. One on the left is a screenshot of ultrasonic noise. And if you do know a little bit about um, PD testing in the phase plots, this phase plot could be quite misleading. It is 180 degrees. There are two clusters with that 180 degree separation, I should say. And it is quite high level at 21 dB. However, the ultrasonic algorithm is detecting this as noise, and it is noise, rightly so. If you listen to the sound file, it's very synthetic. And then that's compared to another source, again, with two clusters of activity, 180 degree separation, similar levels, but it's picking it up as PD. So these algorithms are built into the UltraTev Plus 2, and it's to help people who are just starting, and it's to give you a good indication. It's just one of the tools that we use. Over time, you'll become more and more reliant on the sound itself in ultrasonic testing and then the phase plot, which is the biggest analysis tool that we have in online PD testing. So this is just a bit of a case study of what we have and what me and Brad have found in the field. This is actually one of Brad's examples. So this is an 11 kV VT where the HV leads were too long and when the VT was racked in, they actually began to warp and bend, and you can see them making contact with the outside metalwork on both sides. So that became quite a big problem, and you can see this white powder buildup indicating PD is there. 
So Brad went in and we actually found this had a breathe event at the right base of the panel leading up into the gear. And what we found was this phase plot and its associated ultrasonic sound. So from this phase plot, we used the um, flexible sensor and we found that it looked to be two phases worth of PD discharge. And once they open it up, that's exactly what we found. The best thing about this example is that the ultrasonic algorithm, which you can see here, and just summarized a bit higher, it guaranteed, oh, it said that these sound signals, which is what the ultrasonic algorithm listens for, it said it was caused by PD with 97% surety. So it is a really effective way of testing. And when using that algorithm in conjunction with the phase plots, you can get a very accurate result. And that is our overview of the ultrasonic testing and the different ones that we do do. So we're going to move on to the TEV testing. And TEV testing is more focused on those internal void defects and your contact type PD sources. So again, rather now than listening for the sources and going around the metalwork, the TEV testing, you're using that front capacitive plate and placing it on the metalwork in order to pick up of those tiny voltage rises caused by the EMF put off by a PD source. And what you are doing is you're moving on all of your panels. So we tend to traditionally test on the front circuit breaker of every panel, and then we go around to the back if you can, and especially on older style switch gear, we test every different chamber we can get our hands to, be it the top of the bus chamber, the CT chamber, the cable box, and if possible, even on the HV cable itself just by placing the plus two on the outside of it. It has to go over the screened portion, obviously, because they are high voltage, but you will still get very good TEV signals. We actually believe that the high voltage cable leading into the, the cable box is the best place to test for TEV because it's the closest electrical path to most of the insides of the switchgear. There's a lot less attenuation that happens leading to that HV cable compared to the rest of the um, outside metalwork. But once you do start testing with TEV, there's um, a number of different screens you will look at. So you've got again an interpretation screen. And this interpretation screen looks at your two primary TEV readings, your amplitude in decibel um, millivolts and your um, pulses per cycle or your discharge rate. So it looks at those two numbers and it will give you an indication of what is being caused. And that's again, very helpful for people beginning and learning. However, over time, you will begin to use the phase plot screen, similar to with the ultrasonic sensor. Once you look at these screens, you're looking for that clustering. And again, we'll go over that in more detail in the further analysis webinars. But these are the main ones you'll find yourself using. Once you do start to have more complicated sources, you can start to use things like the histogram screen, but you can do a lot of that analysis on the phase plot as well. And even the waveform screen can be very um, useful. We use that in order to determine if we are local to the source and pinpointing the exact location of it. So when we are doing this testing, if when I walk into a substation, we set a little up, we go into our survey modes, I would start on the circuit breakers and I would go left to right, taking your 10 second recordings on every single circuit breaker. Um, just the front piece of metalwork in front of the panel. You only need to take one TEV recording per panel because on any one given piece of metalwork, the TEV reading should be the same. So we move along and if you do start to find TEV sources, you will notice they will travel. So you'll start to find you're getting higher until you reach the source. And then once you pass it, it will start to go lower again. And that's what we call the localized hub. So once I've done the front of the board, we would go to the back and do the exact same process on the cable boxes, on the cables, on the CT chambers, depending what you have access to on the board. And again, you're looking for that localized high. And you can do all that analysis on site, you can figure it out, you can pinpoint it. Or if you do want to just collect data, the survey mode does give you a perfect heat map where you can actually see the source expanding out from where it's highest. And it's very useful to do that in the, inter, um, in the analysis screens. So this is just a quick example of how our actual interpretation screen works. So as I said, um, when you first start, you'll probably want to use the interpretation screen 
but we really urge people to try and get used to as much of the phase plot screens as possible because you're going to have the best analysis at that point. So with this one, you can see this is from the manual and what the interpretation screen is it looks at the overall amplitude of the signal and then goes and looks at the pulses per cycle or the discharge rate and uses that to estimate what is causing the PD signals. And you can see here that these are both from the same PD source and they do correlate. It says there's a possible low level internal partial discharge and then the phase plot shows a little bit more detail. There is a low level discharge here, but it's actually on two phases. So that's why we say the phase plots will give you the most information. This is just a perfect example. And if you've dealt with VA technology much, you would have seen a lot of these, um, these CTs and these very traditional type internal void patterns. So this is um, a CT of an 11 kV, it's a cast resin one, and we found very high level internal void discharge. So this is it here and it's not far off the textbook example. You've got your two clusters of activity with 180 degree separation and they've got that very stereotypical leading edge that we associate with internal void type problems. So looking at these, we won't go into a huge amount of detail, but using all the tools at our um, disposal, we can one, look at the phase plots and see that that is definitely PD. If you aren't as comfortable with the phase plots yet, you can look at the interpretation, which is stored here, and it says likely high level internal partial discharge. So using all the tools together, that one is very easy to diagnose as an issue. is the HFCT testing. So this is looking for your cable PD sources, or we also use it for a bit more information if you are getting up sources within switchgear. It can see both up and down depending on what filtering you're using. The HFCT you can see there, or Brad's got one oh, here. I've got one here. It attaches around the earth screens of your um, terminations. So the one thing you do need to make sure of with this is that you don't have um, multiple parallel paths for the signals to go around. It works best when there's one path for that. So it just goes around nice and simple. And once you start to do this testing, it can be a little bit more difficult at times because longer cables run through such a large area, they can actually get a large amount of noise induced onto them from multiple different sources. So to counter that, inbuilt into the plus two is actually filtering functionality. So your default is your all pass filter and that allows you to see all data coming through and that will come with a lot of noise occasionally, depending on your site. You can then go up the filters to your filter one, which is a 500 kilohertz high pass filter, and then to filter two, which is a 1.8 megahertz high pass filter. And as you apply these filters, you can slowly filter out some of the external data um, a noise that's inducing on and hopefully be left with just the PD signals. Similar to all of your other screens in TEV and ultrasonic, the phase plots are really your most powerful analysis tool in this. They're the ones that are the easiest to determine exactly what is going on. You're looking for the clustering 180 degrees apart and it still follows very similar rules to the TEV. The one additional feature that we are using more and more often on the UltraTev Plus 2 and the HFCTs is the waveform analysis. So lately we've had some really good results with actually being able to find the distance to the PD source using the UltraTev Plus 2 and the waveform analysis. And that's what our example here is of. So this is an internal void type problem in an XLP joint that we detected from the switchgear end. So the HFCT readings were taken on the screens of the switchgear on a 660 meter cable and a 33 kV cable that was underground its entire run. So you can see on the right here, we've got our unfiltered, our 500 kilohertz filter and our 1.8 megahertz filter. So you can see that this particular signal didn't have a huge amount of background noise, but it did have this low level noise going through it. And as we apply the filters, the noise does disappear until just the PD clusters are remaining. Um, this one is very active on more on one half than the other, but it's still very traditional PD. The incredible thing about this particular source is 
we were able, able to analyze this waveform. And when you look at it, you have these three um, peaks and they're the PD pulses reflecting. So the first peak indicates the beginning of the cable. That's the test end where you are taking the test from. You've then got the third peak, which is the end of the cable, and the middle peak represents the PD source location. So doing a bit of maths to figure this out and using a bit of data about the cable, such as the, it's an XLPE cable, not a um, paper lead, as well as known uh, length of the cable, we're able to do a bit of investigation and determine that that second pulse um, lay 27% down the cable. We also tested from the far end and got the reverse and it correlated very well. We then looked at the company's drawings and they found that they had a joint 180 meters down the cable, which coincided perfectly with where that singular pulse and where we thought the PD source was originating from. So just due to the statistics and the nature of high voltage cables, well, once it starts to line up the joint, we were very confident that's where it is. And that company will actually um, cut that joint out and do a replacement and then retest to make sure it is fine. But it does show the power of the device and we can, we're starting to get more and more accuracy in this type of testing um, compared to traditionally we'd get um, one of our other products, the cable data collector which would recommend for your longer runs of cables, mm -hmm. normally anything over 500 meters. So from there, I'll pass back to Brad and he'll do the other accessories. Okay, so, so Thomas just ran through everything that comes with the kit when you buy an Ultratur Plus 2 Kit 3. So mm -hmm. there are two more additional accessories that come with the kit. Uh, in the past, we've had other products that were individual products for sale, um, but as a company, we are more and more incorporating these products as accessories for the Ultratev Plus 2. So the first one that we'll show you is called the Ultratev Locator 2. So the Ultratev Locator 2 replaces the old Ultratev Locator. That's why it's called the number two. And what it is, is what I have in my hand right here. The way that we use this is we are able to figure out, or if I take a step back, when PD is occurring, it will give off TEV signals that will travel away from their source in every direction. So if this was a PD source, the pulse from this PD source would go across the metalwork in that direction. Now, when I have the Ultratev Locator 2, plus plugged into the Ultratev Locator, I mean, plugged into the Ultratev Plus 2, I've effectively got two TEV sensors. I've got one here in the end of this device, and I've got one here in the end of this device. And I'm able to put these two onto the outside of switch gear and figure out a direction towards the PD signals whilst doing TEV testing. So if the PD signals were coming from that direction, this would see the pulse first, <coughs> this would see the pulse second, and the instrument will tell me that the direction of the signals is coming from that way. So that's how it works, and that's why we call it TEV time of flight testing or TEV locate. Uh, what, this, what it looks like is you've, you've got this box here. This is how the instrument comes. It is in a skinnier little box that actually attaches to the original box. Um, here's a picture of a one of our workers using it in a substation to test between circuit breaker panels to figure out which way TEV signals are coming from. There's also two screens that you can use while you were doing your testing. So the first screen on the left here, it's showing you which of your sensors is triggering and which one is seeing it first. So this one here is your red sensor because it's red. This one's your blue sensor because it's blue. And that's shown on the screen there where you've got your red sensor and your blue sensor. Whichever sees it first, it will tell you. And then you've got an advanced mode. So in advanced mode, it will show you the pulses of the TEV signals on the screen. And you can figure out if you've got one or two TEV sources occurring at the same time and, and what is being detected. So it's very useful in figuring out whether PD is coming from down a cable or from the switchboard as well. So just say you did a, ran a traditional TEV test like what Thomas was speaking about earlier, and you got TEV signals at a cable box and you can see the high voltage cable coming out of that cable box. 
what you are then able to do is run a TEV test between the cable and the switch gear and then down the cable or, or as opposed to up the cable and figure out if the, if the signals are coming from inside the cable box or you could have a joint that's five, 10 metres away mm -hmm. where PD signals are emanating from that joint and they are coming up that way so that the locator will point you towards that. It's good for figuring out noise sources as well. We've used it often to uh, prove that there's a noise source in a room. So just say a battery charger or some sort of fan or, or an electronic relay was, was emitting a, a whole bunch of TEV signals. What we're able to do is to go up and put this on the noise source and then put this on the switchboard and go, well, this is detecting it first. So all of the signals are coming from that noise source and I don't have to worry about them anymore because I've proven that it's not coming from the switchboard. Okay, so that's the Ultratev Plus 2 locator. Then what we have is UHF antennas. So we have two antennas at the moment. Um, and if Thomas hands over some of this equipment, I can show you what they are. So first UHF antenna is the whip antenna. So this picture here that I'm circling. So what you can see here is this is a UHF receiver. This has to plug into the UltraTurf Plus 2 for you to be able to accept UHF signals. And then at the top here, you can plug in different types of UHF antennas. So here we have a whip antenna. A whip antenna is a non-directional antenna that will just sense for PD activity in the air no matter where it is, that it's um it's non-directional as as the name implies. And then what we have is a directional antenna. Now this directional antenna looks amazingly like the old PD Hawk because it's basically the same antenna, but there's no electronics in there anymore. Now what you do is you plug a lead in from the UltraTev Plus 2 into the directional antenna, and that is now an antenna simply for this device. Now what we can do with these antennas, we use these to detect both internal void and surface PD sources. And what we're also able to do is um, ignore corona, because cor what corona does, corona will emit signals up to around about two to three to 400 megahertz, somewhere around that region. But what we do is we tune our instrument up higher than that in the megahertz region so that we ignore corona. The reason we would want them, one reason why you would want to do that is if you're in an outdoor yard that's traditionally quite noisy, there's a lot of buzzing and arcing and sparking going on, we don't really want to see the corona. What we can also do with the instrument itself is use this screen here, which is called the frequency sweep screen. When you go into frequency sweep mode, what the instrument will do is it will automatically scan between 50 megahertz and 1000 megahertz with your antenna. So just say you've got your directional antenna pointed at a, a 66 kV CT or whatever, whatever voltage CT out in the yard, it will figure out what signals are coming from that asset between 50 megahertz and 1000 megahertz. And then what you can do is you can point the antenna at the background, point it over into the paddock next door, and you'll see what the difference is between the background and the actual uh, device under test that you are testing. And from there, you can figure out if PD is occurring uh, or different signals are being emitted by the device. The, um, it has a very long range. So this UHF directional antenna here, when you've got it up to full gain, it can see up to 250 metres down the road. It's, um, it's, it's ideal if you're able to uh, test in such a quiet environment, but quite often it's a bit too noisy for that. Uh, electromagnetically noisy. So what you do is you, you tune the gain down and you walk closer to your assets. We can see phase plots, which is what Thomas has spoken a lot about and which is our, one of our main analysis tools. So it will pick up what type of PD is occurring, uh, which is being detected by the UHF antenna. The phase plots we find look very, very similar to what you find with TEV and with ultrasonic. And we also get a decibel reading, and we are able to tune anywhere from 50 megahertz all the way through to 1,000 megahertz, and tune exactly into set frequencies. The re 
Why would you want to do that, you ask? To avoid noise. One, one reason is we have mobile phone towers, so you have 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G emitting signals around uh, in the area that you're testing. You also have um, radio stations broadcasting, you have television stations broadcasting. All those types of things your antenna will pick up if you are tuned into them. So what we want to do is tune away from them. And then the other reason why you would want to change your megahertz region is because not all PD signals are going to be emitting the exact same amount and amplitudes of UHF activity evenly across the range. So that's why we can tune from there. Okay, so now our data handling. Oh, so they're the, they're the two accessories that are available right now to plug into the Ultratech Plus 2. The, our uh, head office in the UK are working on a few more and they will come out in the future. Now, when we are using the Ultratech Plus 2, how do we capture this data and how do we bring that back to the office for reporting and reporting purposes? One of the quickest and easiest things that you can do is by taking what we call a screenshot. Now to take a screenshot, whatever you have on your front screen, at any moment in time, if you press the outside two buttons, as Thomas just did and he's about to do again, if you press those two buttons at any point in time, it will take a screenshot of whatever's on the screen at the time. It will show you a preview. You can either hit OK or cancel and then once you hit OK, it'll take you through to this here and you can name the file. So it'll give it a date and time stamp and then you can type in whatever you'd like. So transformer one, feeder one, circuit breaker or whatever you want to say about that file. And that gets saved onto the instrument. Now for further more extensive, far more extensive data analysis, what you would like, what we, what we always recommend everyone does is to take a full recording. Now, in the instrument, Thomas spoke earlier about setting up a workflow file where you have a substation layout already pre-populated into your instrument. You can do that, that's the ideal way to do it, but if you don't know the layout of your substation, you basically just input all that data. So we have what's called survey mode. So from the front screen, you click on survey mode, you would start a survey and you would input all the data about who you are, where you are, what the job number is, what the substation name is, what type of switch gear you have. You would also take all your background readings and your, your temperature and humidity. And then you start taking recordings. So you can take TEV recordings, cable PD recordings in all three filters, UHF recordings using any antenna you'd like, and ultrasonic recordings using any ultrasonic sensor you would like. And all of those recordings get um, logged into a summary file that looks like what's on the right hand side here. So from here, you can see a bit of a heat map as to where your low, medium and high level uh, amplitude sources are. What also gets recorded is sound files. So if you take an ultrasonic uh, recording of some PD and you hear that crackling and arcing and sparking sound, that sound will get recorded. Uh, you will see the phase plots, which we use probably 90% of our analysis goes off these phase plots. You can zoom in on them, you can zoom out on them, you can um, download things to Excel spreadsheets if you'd like to. You can also look at the waveforms here and that's where Thomas was talking about seeing the speed of the pulse and if you can see reflections <coughs> down cables. And we use this to diagnose whether we're detecting noise or PD at times. Because sometimes um, the closer you are to a PD source and the stronger it is, basically the sharper and faster this pulse will be. Then we can use a histogram where you can see if you've got what your pulse counts are at different decibels. Okay. Now there's no software required for this. That's one of the really good things about the Ultratech Plus 2 is you don't need any software. There's no software licensing. You just have to get this information to a computer and it all opens up in a web browser. We use Google Chrome, but you can use Firefox or Edge or anything that you would like. So in summary, it's possible. What is possible with the UltraTev Plus 2? So we can do TEV testing, the transient earth voltage testing. And traditionally that will pick up PD defects on the inside of insulation. So we can do the, the straight handheld TEV testing and we can also do the TEV locating, which will give you a direction towards the TEV sources using this one here. 
We can do ultrasonic testing with three different microphones. We can use the airborne, or four different microphones really. You've got the microphone on the inside of the instrument, you've got the flexible microphone, you've got the contact probe, which listens into, into chambers where there's no air path for sounds to get out. And you've got the ultrasonic dish where you need a bit of distance between yourself and the asset under test. Then we can do cable PD testing where we have our high frequency current transformer. We clip that around the screens of cables while the cables are turned on. And we can run through different filters to see if there's any PD signals on those cables or near where you are testing because the PD signals can be coming from the switch gear themselves. We can do UHF testing where we are testing for PD signals in the ultra high frequency range using two antennas. I know that they may be working on another type of antenna over in the UK, which may come out in the future. Uh, but we can test for open in open air assets where you've got a line of sight between yourself and the and the instrument, uh, the item under test, the HV asset under test. And we can also record and analyze. So we can record and analyze data. We can, what we find is that we will have a very, very, very good idea whether we're detecting PD or not in the field by looking at the instrument, using our accessories and analyzing the data in the field. And then to further back that up, we can bring all that data back and we can analyze it with a fine tooth comb by opening up it, opening all the data up in our web browser and we can you know, report from there, analyze from there, send it to other people, ask for different opinions and those types of things. So analysis in the field and in the office is a very, very handy thing to do. And that is basically the end of our webinar. So here are our contact details. If anyone would like to get in contact directly with myself or Thomas, so there's our emails and there's our LinkedIn's. And we have had a few questions come through in the chat box and the question box yep. uh, throughout, the, throughout the webinar so far. If anyone would like to ask any further questions, we can stay on for a few minutes and help that. Can we get the presentation slide ready? I'm sure we send it through. Yeah, yeah. It come through. yeah, I'm pretty sure the slide pack will come through of these slides once the webinar is finished and uh, that will be a through after the webinar. Yep. And so you won't get a recording. That would be way too big. <laughs> <It'd be laughs> but the recording does get put on YouTube. So if you do want to come back and watch this or any of our other ones, they are available online. Yep. So if anyone's got any questions, please shoot them through now or we can call it. Um, while some of the questions do come through, we're just going to run one well, the last poll basically of just what we are looking to do in the future. So if you do, uh, if you are interested in any of the future topics, just click at what you're doing and we're gonna look at running these more in the future. I've just been told that a link to the recording is sent to you, so you will get the recording. Uh, well, a link to it anyway. So that poll is open now. If you'd like to, if you wanna have a vote, please do so. I hope they can still hear us. And you still hear us. <laughs> We're just finding out. I'm pretty sure you can. Yep. So, um, we do just have a question here about someone who has the UHF accessory. There wasn't a specific manual. Our baseline manual for the UltraTev Plus 2 has been updated to include the UHF. Um, if you haven't got the, the latest manual, we can email that through to you after this. What's his name? I'll send that through. Um, Terence NG. Terence NG. Okay, so Terence, we'll email you through that um, the latest user manual, basically. Yeah, it's empty. No worries. Yeah, we'll send that through. And um, we've got a few votes through for the poll. Thank you very much. Uh, there's no more questions. I think we'll uh, we'll call it there, and we thank everyone for coming along as always. And everyone, we wish you all the best. Just yeah. be safe out there. Yeah. And if you do need anything, please get in contact with us. We're more than happy to answer questions. Yep. We'll go from there.